uh, namely a global Britain in a competitive age, the integrated review of security, defense development, and foreign policy. Uh, the document is important uh, given the, the circumstances uh, created by Brexit and a worsening global security environment. Number of essential issues uh, are addressed, uh, for instance, the document suggests what countries are described as threat or uh, systemic competitor for UK uh, regarding uh, our re uh, region in the Pacific. Uh, it underlined uh, the region in a specific uh, section. Uh, even for me, the, the one of uh, the interesting part is on the page 19, it expli uh, explicitly uh, stated the UK will not be able to achieve this objective working alone, collective action and co-creation with our allies and partners will be vitally important in the decade ahead. Of course, uh, the document has attracted uh, attention and various responses, not only uh, from other governments, uh, but also from academic worlds. Uh, of course, uh, several uh, questions may arise how will the back uh, to the UK Indonesia strategic partnership? What kind of uh, priorities and strategies that British government will prepare to the region and also ASEAN uh, following uh, the UK new status as an ASEAN dialogue partner? Uh, is the recent uh, trilateral uh, security pact, AUKUS, uh, part of uh, the British strategy to Indo Pacific? Um, to discuss uh, this uh, issue, uh, I'm happy uh, to have uh, the opportunity uh, to introduce our distinguished speaker, His Excellency Ambassador Owen Jenkins, British Ambassador to Indonesia and Timor-Leste. We are grateful for his presence among us today. Good afternoon, Excellency. How are you? Good afternoon, ba Anton. I'm extremely well. How are you? Uh, good, thank you. Hopefully, uh, Ambassador Jenkins' uh, lecture will enrich and provide us uh, as academics uh, more understanding on how we should analyze the current uh, bilateral diplomacy between UK and Indonesia and also uh, regional security dynamics. Uh, so, uh, student, uh, please uh, take note on that. Before I pass the floor to Ambassador Jenkins, uh, may I invite uh, Professor Didik Rahbini, Rector of uh, Paramadina University, to give a welcoming remarks. Please, uh, Prof. Rahbini, the floor is yours. Okay, terima kasih, Pak Anton. Ya. Uh, selamat sore. Ya. Uh, good afternoon. <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Ya. His Excellency Ambassador, ya, Bapak Awan Jenkins, ya. Ibu Dr. Siska Prabowo Ning Tias, ya, or in Japanese Prabowo Ning Tias, ya. There is no relationship with Pak Prabowo, and then Ibu Fat and all uh, lecturers and students and participants. Ya. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Ambassador, ya, Bapak Owen Jenskin, ya, that accepting our invitation from Paramadina. Graduate School of uh, Diplomacy, yeah. that is uh, headed by Dr. Siska. Yeah. This is a honor for us to have uh, you in this forum uh, to discuss about the very uh, big uh, picture, yeah. global Britain, and then uh, Indo-Pacific and relationship between Indonesia and UK. Yeah. But I, I would like to stress also not only the big picture, but uh, UNTAS Paramagna has a good relationship with, with the British Council. Yeah? And this is maybe could be uh, continued uh, during your period in Jakarta. And I would like to have uh, maybe some uh, cooperation in level of organization like Paramagna and Embassy or British Council. Yeah? Starting from private issues, yeah, uh, about relationship, yeah. Uh, UK is it's so familiar with me, yeah. London, Warwick, yeah, and others because three of my children uh, educated in UK, yeah, in University College London, and then uh, 
University of Birmingham, Birmingham, and now still in King College. Yeah? So this is maybe uh, uh, my private experience that we, in the future, uh, having uh, uh, co cooperation in the organization, on an organization level. Yeah? I would like to emphasize that this topic is quite broad. Yeah? Maybe we can discuss uh, 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 so many issues related with the Indonesian interest and UK interest. Yeah? Uh, the first issue that may be yeah, very important for almost every country is COVID. Yeah? I don't know, maybe uh, UK British experience uh, can be discussed here eh, to be uh, issues of relationship between Indonesia and uh, UK. Yeah? The other issues uh, for Indonesian interest yeah, related with the political economic issues. Yeah? For instance, yeah, about palm oil, for example. Yeah? Uh, this is a very long struggle for uh, Indonesia because related with 13 million uh, plantation and million of uh, farmers. Yeah? And according to uh, uh, some expert, this is uh, not friendly. Environment, environmentally, but we can discuss later on that uh, we can prove that uh, palm oil issues, uh, it is also good for Indonesia and others. Yeah? Even this is not directly uh, issues of uh, UK because UK uh, separated already from EU, yeah? but I hope UK can be supportive for Indonesian interest like uh, political economy. Yeah? The other issues, there are also so many issues around us yeah? about humanity. Yeah? human rights and democracy. In front of ASEAN, we have problem with uh, Myanmar. Yeah? And also we have problem with uh, Afghanistan. How can we uh, hold that problem uh, in terms of uh, international diplomacy? Yeah? Actually, by, uh, by education, I'm not uh, uh, in, diploma, uh, in uh, international uh, 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 education. Yeah? not international uh, and international issues yeah. by education i am the political economist yeah but at least i can absorb uh, the, this discussion for uh, 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 my further knowledge yeah i think that's a very short uh, introduction but uh, one thing that that is very very important for for ambassador yeah we have uh, related with the uh, uh, organizational relationship, yeah? maybe important in the future. We have one a student from UK. Yeah? Maybe we will invite a student uh, studying diplomacy and uh, Indonesian culture and studying also Islamic philosophy in Paramarina. Yeah? We can accept uh, uh, with the uh, scholarship and so on. Yeah? I would like to uh, uh, give uh, very short issues that is important for us, yeah? not only in the Paramadina level, but Indonesian level. Yeah? In 1970s and 1980s, yeah, there is cooperation between Indonesian embassy and uh, uh, Ministry of Education. United States invited uh, a lot of leaders, yeah? young leaders, Islamic leaders in Indonesia to study in United States, yeah? And then after that, in 1980s and 1990s, they, they were coming to Indonesia and uh, uh, influencing the uh, open and moderate view of Islamic uh, culture, yeah? After that, yeah, there is no program like that. And then Indonesia influenced by so many uh, issues, moderate uh, versus radical and so on, yeah? So uh, Nur Khalis Majid, the founder of Paramaida, is one of them, yeah? the young student, young leader, invited by the embassy of the United States coming to USA and then coming uh, to Indonesia as the leaders yeah? and spreading the issues of moderation and then Islamic friendly and so on. Yeah? So this is uh, one of uh, small experience that can be, that can inspire, uh, uh, I hope, cooperation uh, in uh, Paramaida level yeah? with uh, uh, Excellency Ambassador Bapak Owen Jenskin. Ya. Terima kasih, Pak. Uh, thank you very much. Ya. Uh, selamat sore. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.
Waalaikumsalam warahmatullah. Um, uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, Rahbini, for the warm remarks. Without further ado, uh, I would invite Ambassador Jenkins uh, to deliver his lecture. Please, Excellency, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Anton. Um, and let me first of all express uh, my uh, deep gratitude and appreciation to all of the leadership uh, of Barat Medina University for their invitation uh, to speak today. You, you thanked me, but really the honor is mine. Um, I'm, I'm extremely appreciative and grateful for, for this opportunity. Um, and let me acknowledge in, in particular um, the leadership of uh, Paramedina University, uh, His Excellency, uh, the Rector, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Didi uh, Rahmini, the Vice Rector for Academic and Student Affairs, Dr. Fahtia uh, Kertemuda, Dean of the Faculty of Philosophy and Civilization, Tia Rahmania, Director of Paramedina Graduate School of Diplomacy, Dr. Shishka Prabawanintias, and the head of the International Relations Department, Dr. Tato Joko Sudiarto. Pat uh, Didit has already set out some really important issues, um, which, which we, I hope, will touch on today. Um, my speech won't necessarily uh, mention all of them, but we have the chance in question and answer at the end to, to go through any, any of the issues which I, which I don't talk about. Um, and I've heard so much about Paramedina University um, and about the intelligence and sharpness of its students. Um, so I am a little bit worried about the question and answer session. Um, so I will talk for a long time so that there can be as few questions as possible. Um, so in, in my lecture today, um, I aim to talk a little bit um, about Indonesia um, and uh, my experience of it here, then about the wider Indo-Pacific uh, and what role the UK uh, intends to play there and in the wider world. And finally, I will talk a little bit about some shared opportunities and challenges and how we uh, intend to address them. Um, and Pat Anton has already mentioned the, the integrated review, which was the basis of our current uh, foreign policy. And he quite rightly highlighted the uh, strong emphasis in that document um, on collaborative approaches and multilateral approaches, because we are very conscious uh, that none of the challenges um, that we face today, um, including um, COVID-19, as, as the Rector mentioned, um, including regional and uh, international security issues, none of these can be addressed unilaterally. Uh, and we will always work with, with our partners and friends, such as Indonesia, to address them. So first of all, just a word on, on Indonesia. Um, I've only been here for two years and two months. Um, and unfortunately, only eight months of that period um, were free of COVID. Um, so the rest has been rather impacted um, by um, the strange world in which we've lived for the last 18, uh, 18 months or so. Um, but despite uh, uh, COVID's very best efforts, I'm the latest in a very long run of British ambassadors to Indonesia. I think we've had 20 since um, independence, who've really fallen in love with the country. It is the most extraordinary country. Um, the landscapes, the volcanoes, coasts, coral reefs, oceans, um, the cultures, um, so many amazing languages, um, different groups, but all combined in a harmonious whole of a single Indonesia. And of course, the food, um, nasi padang, um, gado gado is one of my favorites. Um, and of course, uh, Indonesian coffee is fantastic. Um, but beyond these sort of physical manifestations, one thing that I've really been struck by uh, since my arrival in Indonesia is the sense of the future, um, the sense that Indonesia is moving dynamically and confidently uh, towards the opportunity of the 21st century, a sense that things are changing here every day. Um, right now, over 50% 50, over 50 of Indonesians are under 30 years of, old, of, of age. This is a young country um, and a young people, a young country like Indonesia has a sense of possibility, a sense that change can be made to happen. Indonesia will be, um, it is predicted, the fourth largest economy in the world by 2050. Its role in the world then and even before then will be even bigger than it is today. And, and you, the students listening to this lecture today, the international relations students of today, and Indonesia's diplomats of tomorrow, I'm sure, will shape that role. You will help to decide. 
what world Indonesia wants, how Indonesia will stand in that, in that world, and how it will work with others uh, to make that world possible. Now, briefly turning to, to the region, we all know that the 21st century will be the Asian century. If the world was just seven people, then four of them would live in Asia. The Asian Development Bank predicts that by 2050, per capita income in purchasing power parity terms across Asia will have risen, risen six times to reach what Europe's is today. So in our lifetimes, we will see a flatter world, a, a wealthier world, and we hope a more multilateral world. And in that world, Indonesia, the fourth most populous country in the world, will have a huge impact. But progress isn't certain, and it very rarely moves in a straight line. Uh, it's always unpredictable. But what we do know is that in the years to come, the Indo-Pacific region will be at the center of many of the globe's most pressing challenges, from climate change to maritime security to geopolitical competition. And just thinking about the UK in that world for a moment, the global Britain part of the title of this lecture, we recognize that shift and we have already been responding to it. Earlier this year, as Pak Anton mentioned, uh, we announced the, review, the, the results um, of the UK's integrated review of security, defense, development and foreign policy. This was, as I, as I say, the biggest review of what, we're, what we are doing and how we do it since the Cold War. Um, I joined our diplomatic service in 1991, um, and I can't remember such a deep and thorough review of what we've done. It was entitled Global Britain in a Competitive Age, and I think that captures quite a lot of what we intend to talk about today. The review recognised that we have deep and long-standing relationships and major interests across the Indo-Pacific region. It recognised that we need to be committed and are committed for the long term to engaging bilaterally and multilaterally. And it made clear that the United Kingdom would tilt in the language of the review to the Indo-Pacific, putting more attention, more resources and more energy into building up our relations with this part of the world. And this isn't just words. Um, in the last five years, my embassy, the British embassy in Jakarta, um, has got 50% bigger in terms of its staffing. We've opened new embassies in the region, four new em embassies in the last uh, three years, including a dedicated mission to ASEAN uh, with its own ambassador um, as we take up the status of ASEAN's newest dialogue partner. Naval visits, security links, defense diplomacy, trade have all grown in that period. And we hope to use uh, dialogue partner status and the partnership it gives us um, as another way of increasing our commitment and engagement with this crucial re re uh, region. But we also wanted to undertake this review um, because we see that parts of our shared international architecture are increasingly frayed and some of them are under threat. The UK knows that we need to demonstrate what we genuinely believe, that liberal democracies and free markets remain the best model for the social and economic advancement of humankind, that those frameworks, those vehicles are our best route to a better world. And in order to do that, in order to demonstrate the value of liberal democracy and free markets, uh, in the review, we set out what we mean by global Britain and how we plan to engage with the world and strengthen global cooperation. Our vision of global Britain is built on confidence in our enormous existing strengths, strengths which mean that when all of you are the future diplomats of Indonesia, you will want to talk to the United Kingdom about all of the world's problems. So the UK, UK is the fifth largest economy in the world. We're at the forefront of the modern economy, um, particularly the digital economy, and have produced the largest number of tech unicorns in Europe with 77 British tech companies worth over a billion dollars. We're a science and technology superpower, developing the technologies and innovations which will power the future. We have 99 Nobel science laureates and are home to leading medical research shown by the extraordinarily rapid development of the Oxford University AstraZeneca vaccine. We're a global leader in diplomacy with the fourth biggest diplomatic network in the world, and I would say the best, but then I would say that, wouldn't I? 
Um, we hold the G7 presidency this year and are playing host to COP26, the critical climate summit, summit which will take place uh, in, uh, in Glasgow in November. And I mention these things because we are genuinely committed to economic cooperation and multilateral diplomacy, as well as strong bilateral relationships. And it's not all about the government. Um, what, what Pat Didick said earlier about his family's relationships with the UK, I think shows the power of soft power, the power of people to people relationships. Um, some of you may have heard some of British music, um, the Beatles or Queen or the Rolling Stones or Ed Sheeran or Adele, um, I could go on. You may know some of our, um, our TV or our films, so Harry Potter or Peaky Blinders. Um, and you may have come across some of our football clubs, um, and certainly the question I have been asked most since I arrived in, 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 in Indonesia is, um, which team is your team pack? Um, and just to preempt that question later, it's Arsenal, um, and we're not doing very well this year, but it will, it will get better. So um, these are some of our strengths alongside the, the more conventional ones. But what do we mean when we talk about global Britain? What does the UK want to do? with all of these strengths. If I had to put it in one sentence, and this is framed in the integrated review, it means that the UK is a liberal and free trading nation, which acts with strong moral anchors as a force for good in the world. We believe that we are at our best when we are facing outwards, when we're open to the world and solving problems together. And what does that mean in practice? Well, it means that we're liberal. It means we're liberal when we're standing up for girls to have a right to education across the world, for female empowerment, for the protection of religious and ethnic minorities, for LGBTQ plus rights, because it's the right thing to do. We emphasize free trade and openness as we seek agreements around the world that remove barriers to trade and movement. And we've opened up our immigration system to the world so that nobody faces different treatment now on the basis of their nationality. Everyone in the world is now judged by the UK immigration system on the basis of their skills and what they can bring to the UK, because that's the fair thing to do. We act with strong moral anchors as we call for fair access to vaccines for all and through our multilateral first response to COVID-19. So when the UK government funded the Oxford University AstraZeneca research into a COVID-19 vaccine, we made it a condition that those vaccines should be supplied to the world at cost. And because of this, the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine uh, is about $4 a dose. That's three times cheaper than the next cheapest vaccine from anywhere in the world. And it's one of the most effective. We've given over half a billion pounds to COVAX, the multilateral vaccine system, um, and we've donated, uh, we will donate over 100 million of our own surplus vaccines to the countries who most need them by June 2022. And we've already given 600,000 of those to Indonesia with, with more to come. We also act um, with a moral anchor when we act against climate change. Uh, we are hosting COP26, as I mentioned, and we are a major actor in ensuring that developed countries live up to their commitment of donating $100 billion uh, you, uh, per year over the next five years on climate. We're also a force for good when we stand up for multilateralism and the rules-based system. As international relations students, you will know that the rules-based international system is the, the jargon, the phrase that we use when we're talking about our shared institutions, the norms, the international law, which governs how countries behave and have behaved since the Second World War. It's not perfect, we'd be the first to admit that, um, but it does mean that we have experienced one of the most peaceful uh, uh, eras in human history um, since that time, though punctuated by many tragedies. So we know that we need to stand up for that system and protect it and support it. Not every country thinks that. Some countries act um, outside that system, whether by invading other countries, um, ignoring aspects of international law, whether that's um, land base or the law of the sea, funding and arming dictators who oppress their people, or using uh, uh, forbidden weapons such as chemical weapons against civilians. Some states want to weaken 
this international system and they make excuses when they break it. But we're all better off if we play by the, by the same rules. We're all better off if we work together to uphold those rules and if states who believe in them work closely to do so. So that's what we mean by global Britain. So if that's who we are, and I've described a little bit about the world that we are inhabiting, what opportunities do we have and what challenges do we face? And how are the UK and Indonesia working together within their strategic partnership to try to move forwards? I'm going to talk about four big challenges and opportunities, which I think the United Kingdom and Indonesia face together. Challenge one, we are heading for climate disaster, but we have the opportunity to build back better and to fight climate change while future-proofing our economy. Challenge two, education needs are transforming. Our economies are changing and requiring new skills, new knowledge. If we don't change alongside that, we will not keep pace and our society's talents and skills will go to waste. But the opportunity there is that education, as you all know as, as teachers much better than I do, education can transform lives, it can transform societies, it has that potential. And it can ensure that we build bridges between our societies, uh, which will benefit all of us. Challenge three is to create economic opportunity for all in our country, to create sustainable development uh, for all of our areas and all of our people wherever they live. And the opportunity there is to level up the areas across our country and make sure no one is left behind and to create a free and transparent international trading and economic system which drives up prosperity everywhere. And challenge four, which I've touched on, is to keep strong international rules and systems when they're put under pressure. But the prize, the opportunity, is a peaceful and stable and secure rules-based international system. So let me take those in, in that order. First of all, how do we avoid catastrophic climate change, build back better and future-proof our economies? Let's be real. Climate change is the biggest global challenge that we all face. We are already seeing the impacts of the heating that's already been in the system, uh, such as more frequent and more extreme weather events, heat waves, droughts, floods, and so on. We believe that uh, capping uh, global heating to 1.5 degrees is our best achievable and least bad scenario. But unfortunately, although that's set out as, as the goal in the Paris Agreement, um, it looks as if we will go above global heating of 1.5 degrees by 2030, and that we're headed for uh, heating of at least uh, between 1.5 and 2 degrees average global temperature rise this century if we don't take action now. So the Paris Agreement goals are only just within reach and we need rapid and immediate cuts in emissions and, net zero, and movement towards net zero to be achieved by mid-century or sooner. This is one of the challenge which really, challenges which really requires countries to work together. And that's why the United Kingdom stepped up to uh, host COP26 in Glasgow this year. This will be a milestone conference and as president, the UK is working intensively with countries around the world to secure new commitments um, and action which puts the world on track to limiting heating to 1.5 degrees, to deliver the climate finance necessary to back up that action and to ensure that developing countries uh, can cope with the impacts of the heating which is already in the system, and to enable countries like Indonesia to benefit from the social and economic advantages of low carbon development, like access to cleaner, safe and reliable energy, cleaner air, cleaner water. The UK and Indonesia are important countries in this area because of our size and the power of our economy. And we already have a, a strong partnership on climate change and low carbon development, which has already delivered. I'm very proud that we have a 20 year forestry partnership with Indonesia. Uh, where the UK has worked to support Indonesia's world leading development of a legal timber certification system, which has significantly reduced illegal deforestation and helped increase trade. And we're proud to partner with Indonesia through the UK Indonesia Mentari Low Carbon Energy Partnership 
and through the co-chaired UK Indonesia Friends of Indonesia Renewable Energy or FIRE dialogues. And we do this because Indonesia has a critical role in this, given its size, its status as a G20 member and its extraordinary natural resources, its forests, which are crucial for millions of livelihoods, as, uh, as Pat Pidit mentioned, and for absorbing greenhouse gas emissions, and fossil fuels, which need to be phased out rapidly to prevent the worst of global heating. Globally, the power sector accounts for about a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions, and we need to make sure that to prevent that, we move much more rapidly away from fossil fuel, particularly coal-fired power, and towards renewable energy, um, perhaps five times faster than before. But this is an opportunity. Energy transition, as well as tackling the climate emergency, helps us grow our economies. Climate action doesn't mean sacrificing economic growth. Evidence from Bapanas's Low Carbon Development Initiative report shows that low carbon growth will deliver for Indonesia an average of 6% GDP growth. It's higher than the business as usual scenario. And even since that report, the cost of renewable power has been falling. Solar and wind are now cheaper than coal and gas plants in two thirds of the countries of the world. Indonesia has abundant natural resources, and I really applaud the ambition which the government of Indonesia is showing in uh, moving towards uh, renewable energy, setting itself ambitious targets, um, and setting itself uh, the ambitious target of making the forestry and land use sector a net carbon sink by 2030, uh, which is hu hugely ambitious, and we're proud to work alongside Indonesia to support the government of Indonesia's own priorities and own plans uh, for tackling this challenge. The second challenge that I want to mention is the challenge of education. As I said, our economies and societies are changing. The skills and knowledge which I learned at university um, are no longer the ones which my children need as they grow up in this, in this changed world. Education can transform life, life chances. And because of Indonesia's importance in the new world, the UK-Indonesia partnership on education is right at the top of our agenda. Indonesia is one of the UK's five priority countries globally for education. And we see the UK's dynamic and world-class education system as a key part of our collaborative partnership with Indonesia. We have a joint working group um, on education with the Indonesian Ministry of Education, Culture and Research. And we're increasing student mobility links between the UK and Indonesia. And we would love to take forward the opportunity, which Pat Didit mentioned, to uh, in, ensure that Paramadina is fully included in this work. Um, we have an annual scholarship scheme, um, which this year is sending 77 Indonesian students to study for master's degrees in the UK, the Chevening scheme. Uh, we would love for Paramadina to contribute to, to that scheme and send students to apply to it. And 181 Indonesian students will start studying in the UK this month um, under the Indonesian government's new scholarship program, uh, Campus Merdeka, which allows Indonesian students to apply for two semesters of study overseas. And we're very proud that the UK was the most popular destination um, for Indonesian students in this, I think a tribute uh, to the quality of education which uh, we can get in the UK. And it's not only in higher education where we work. The UK Skills for Prosperity uh, programme supports President Jokowi's uh, top priorities on economic development and human capital. The programme works with four Indonesian maritime polytechnics to help reform skills and technical training in the maritime sector. And as two seafaring uh, maritime nations, the UK and, and Indonesia are uniquely placed to support each other in this area. And we're also committed to expanding opportunity in Indonesia through education, through our Future Females Business School to train up female entrepreneurs, our Tech for Empower programs, which expand opportunity, and our Digital Access program, which brings the benefits of technology to rural communities. Turning now to challenge three, how to level up our societies um, so that all areas and all people in the UK and Indonesia benefit from this new world of opportunity, from our shared growth and prosperity? How do we tap into the opportunity which is presented by the extraordinary talent and, and potential in our regions and use international openness to trade and investment 
to drive up prosperity for all. In this area, both the UK and Indonesia want to create inclusive and sustainable economic growth throughout our societies, and our decentralised systems of government allow us more than ever to ensure that regional governments can set their own agendas and deliver on the priorities that matter to them. But in the UK, at least, we suffer and we face significant inequality between British regions. We want to tackle that by levelling up and uh, ensuring that those regions which uh, have been left behind have fair opportunities. And in both countries, our, our regions are hotbeds of potential, they're powerhouses. That's why it's so important, not only for central governments to talk to each other in the UK-Indonesia strategic partnership, but for our regions, our cities and our provincial leaders to forge close, closer relationships with each other. Liverpool and Surabaya, Denpasar and Brighton, West Java and Greater Manchester, uh, indeed Jakarta and West Midlands. We, we're already doing it and we know it works. Liverpool and Surabaya became sister cities only in 2018. And since then, we've seen Indonesian investment into Tranmere Rovers, a championship uh, football club, uh, the sharing of world-class expertise from the UK in teaching visually impaired children in Surabaya, university collaborations, increased people to meet people links and much more just from that one exchange. Our work continues with other regions to make sure that that can be replicated elsewhere. And we're keen to support from the British Embassy that work. But there's also global action we can take to drive up economic opportunity. All of your studies in economic history will tell you that free trade is critical to driving prosperity across societies. With Indonesia, the UK has a ministerially led forum to explore opportunities to identify and resolve barriers to free trade and investment, to promote and facilitate trade, investment and economic cooperation, and to facilitate private sector communication between our two countries. Protecting and developing a free and vibrant international trading architecture is key to both our countries domestic prosperity across the board. The fourth great opportunity is for us to build a peaceful, stable and secure rules based international system. I've touched on this already, and I would say that we need to ensure that multilateral fora like the United Nations, the World Trade Organization, global human rights and justice mechanisms remain relevant and retain global trust. And we're conscious that the UK has significant responsibility in this area as a permanent member of the Security Council, a member of the G7 and of the G20, a leading member of NATO and the Commonwealth, a major development and humanitarian donor and a champion of human rights. And we're working closely with like-minded partners like Indonesia to champion the basic freedoms enshrined in the UN Charter, to support UN peace operations around the world, to defend the rules-based international system and to fight on issues that threaten our collective peace and security. We're not under any illusions. Freedoms need to be defended. So we are also building strong security and diplomatic ties around the world. And that is why, as some of you may have seen, my Prime Minister alongside President Biden and Prime Minister Morrison announced uh, last week that the United Kingdom, United States and Australia would be creating a new security partnership called AUKUS, um, Australia, UK, US. I should say that AUKUS is not a treaty, it's not a pact, it's not a new alliance. It's a defence security arrangement between countries which have a long-standing arrangement uh, in this area. Um, the United Kingdom has been working with Australia on submarines since 1914. Um, so 107 years later, this is, this is not a sudden development. These are partnerships which we put a lot of trust in. The first act will be to uh, support Australia in obtaining uh, nuclear powered submarines. And let me stress propelled by nuclear power, not carrying nuclear weapons. This move is compliant with the non-proliferation treaty. It's fully within the international non-proliferation regime to which the United Kingdom attaches huge importance and scrupulous safeguards will be put in place. The United Kingdom and United States have operated nuclear submarines safely for the last 60 years, and we determined that those very high standards will be maintained. 
This new partnership will strengthen our capacity to work with Indo-Pacific partners to preserve peace and stability, to boost security and stability in this region, and to protect the rules-based environment on which all of our sovereignty, prosperity and security is built. So this effort to build alliances, to work with partners, to work alongside like-minded countries, to preserve our shared multilateral system, I think is perhaps the, the bedrock of the UK-Indonesia strategic partnership. The common themes um, across these challenges and opportunities is that all countries have a stake. All countries face these problems together and need shared solutions. So let me close briefly by considering how we can work together to resolve the major challenges to a secure and prosperous world. Let's not kid ourselves. We face many challenges. We face conflict, whether in the Middle East, uh, in Myanmar, or in Afghanistan, uh, where I have spent um, uh, quite a long time as our Prime Minister's Special Representative for that region. We face cross-border threats um, in, from organized crime, from cyber attacks, from illegal migration, and from cross-border terrorists. Many of our problems are not constrained by borders, and they will not be solved unless countries work across borders to solve them. Our opportunity, as well as our challenge, is to find new ways to work together. We have many of the tools that we need to do this. Our shared system of international law and multilateral institutions has been developed over many years to give us a framework to address and resolve challenging issues of international peace and security. Other issues, whether new health challenges or some of the new technologies and innovations which we need for climate change, will be dealt with through scientific collaboration, another hugely cross-border endeavour, and one where I'm very proud that the UK has become one of Indonesia's top five science and research partners, due primarily to fantastic work under our Newton Fund, which brings together researchers from both sides. Many economic challenges are best addressed through a free and open international economic and trade environment, and supporting and strengthening our international economic uh, architecture. Indonesia's G20 presidency next year will be a fantastic opportunity for our two countries to work together on many of these shared challenges in just one of the multilateral uh, partnerships which we share. And I'm delighted that we're already discussing key themes. So in conclusion, in Indonesia and the Indo-Pacific, we have a country and a region full of potential. In global Britain, there is a partner we hope you want to work with. And there are many, many challenges which we can only face, we can better face together, creating opportunities which uh, we best use by using our shared international architecture and open and transparent collaboration. We're committed to doing so and look forward to working with Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you uh, for presenting a very fascinating lecture, uh, Excellencies. Uh, now it's time for Q&A. Uh, and your fascinating uh, lecture reflect to uh, so many questions uh, has been uh, written in, on, on the chat room. <laughs> so maybe I will try to, uh, to read uh, for you, uh, but maybe I would also request to, to, to have an extension uh, regarding, uh, to, according to our schedule, it, it should be stopped in the next uh, 13 minutes. Uh, so because I already write uh, at least 14 uh, <laughs> attendees raised question. <laughs> Um, maybe I, I try to, to, to make it short. Uh, I, can, I can certainly extend for another 15 minutes if that's helpful. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you, thank you, thank you, Excellencies. Um, some of uh, the questions relate to AUKUS. Uh, first is maybe a Teddy uh, from uh, Lipotanam. Uh, he is a journalist. Uh, uh, the question is how United Kingdom overcomes the impact of AUKUS pack, which many observers predict that it could lead to competition for nuclear weapons in the region. Uh, also, uh, Farizal is also a journalist. Uh, how UK uh, relationship with China at the moment, uh, and also will the alliance expand in the future uh, by inviting other countries? And also, uh, Judith uh, Ora, also a journalist, uh, saying Okos is designed 
to promote stability in the in the Pacific region. Could you please elaborate what advantages or benefits that Indonesia could experience from this partnership? And I think the last one that I would read for for the the AUKUS topic is from Dedi Komarudin. Uh, it's a student at the PGSD. The question. Uh, as Mr. Ambassador mentioned that in the Pacific will play a strategic role in the future in the case of maritime security, what kind of role that you can expect from Indonesia to play in maritime security issue, especially related to AUKUS alliance? Uh, I think that's for, uh, for the first round, uh, Excellency. Maybe you want to uh, respond first for the, regarding the AUKUS? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and um, great questions. I will do my best to do them justice. Uh, and let me start with, with the question at, at the end about um, Indonesia's role in, in all of this. And I think um, Indonesia is a, a strong supporter of the multilateral system. And I think the, um, uh, the support and encouragement which Indonesia gives to the United Nations um, Convention on the Law of the Sea um, and uh, uh, the importance of abiding by international law, I think, is, is a really important um, element, perhaps the key element um, for all of us uh, in ensuring that stability and security across the Indo-Pacific region are, are protected. So, uh, and that framework of international law is something which we are very devoted to, um, particularly on the maritime side. Um, London, as you probably know, is the home of the International Maritime Organization. Um, reflecting our uh, extraordinary maritime heritage. Um, uh, uh, Indonesia has, has a similar one, and we are extremely keen um, and determined, I would say, to ensure that we develop the AUKUS arrangement um, and partnership in full compliance uh, with international law, um, whether that's law of the sea, the non-proliferation regimes, or our other international commitments. Um, we are... Um, uh, very clear that this uh, will not lead to any proliferation of, of nuclear weapons. It's not a transfer of weapons technology. Um, it's about nuclear propulsion. Um, it's within the framework of the non-proliferation, nuclear non-proliferation treaty. Um, and we believe it will contribute to uh, regional and international security and, and stability. We remain very committed to our commitments under the Treaty of Am Amity and Cooperation, for example. We're proud to become the latest ASEAN dialogue partner. And we believe that stability is, is best served uh, by ensuring that countries work together in support of international norms. And that's what we intend to do with, with AUKUS. Um, there will be, it's, it's a long-term process. I know that there's been a lot of noise about it in, in recent weeks, um, but this is a, a long-term partnership. I've already referred to the depth and length of the partnership which the United Kingdom has with Australia, we are a similar, similar long-term ally um, with the United States. Um, so this will be something which develops over time. Um, and we look forward to, to doing so in a way which works closely uh, with uh, regional partners and ensures um, that it is in the service of, uh, of international peace and security. Um, and just a word on that uh, relationship with, with China, um, that angle, um, we're keen to have a, a positive and uh, collaborative uh, relationship with China where we can. Um, we are clear that there are many, many issues in the world which can only be solved by all countries of the world, including China working together. Um, climate change is, is first among them, and His Excellency President Xi Jinping made some important announcements at the UN yesterday on that area, recommitting China um, to serious action in the area of climate change. Um, so we're keen to work together with them, um, but where there are issues uh, uh, which touch on our, our values or important British interests, we will continue to raise those uh, with our Chinese colleagues and friends. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, Excellency, for your response. Uh, I will try to, to read another uh, question also. I think it's an uh, interesting point that uh, they, are, uh, they, they, they have raised. First is uh, from Kevin Bryce uh, from uh, Pegasi. This is a student from London, uh, Excellencies. Um, the question is, in the light of uh, Pak Didik's comment and the cons conservative turn witnessed uh, in the last 10 or 15 years with the backlash uh, with the organizations such as uh, GIL, what concrete step can the UK and others uh, take to strengthen academic and cultural links uh, with Indonesia to help uh, counter-terrorism? 
Uh, it's also related to, to another question, Prasetya Anugrah Pratam, also from PGSD. Does approach to Indo-Pacific region is part of UK strategy culture, since it seems like far from uh, how others uh, EU government approach with focusing on persuasive approach rather than uh, had, uh, power. Do you have any response uh, to that question, um, Excellency? Of course, and I think the two are very linked. And I, uh, I really don't agree that the UK approach here is is based on on hard power. Of course. We have hard power. We're one of the leading defense, intelligence, and security powers in the world. But I think the, the surprising thing about Britain is the extent of our soft power. Um, that I, I talked about that a little in my in my speech. Um, and I think that the the power of people to people relationships is what will really drive um, our shared security and prosperity in in the next decades. Um, I talked a bit about the educational exchanges uh, which we which we have, and I think uh, in order to ensure that um, liberal and uh, open values uh, are are spread and are shared around the world, it is through uh, academic exchanges, cultural exchanges, exposing different parts of both societies um, to the realities of life in the other. I think is is extremely important. Um, so we've run a number of programs which which do this. Some of them are in the educational sphere. Some of them are in the area of um, interfaith dialogue, um, which I think is a really important um, issue and one which can contribute not only to questions of uh, extremism, extremism and radicalization, but also on issues like climate change, uh, where all of the major faiths um, uh, know that we have to preserve um, the creation and this world which we share uh, and take action to do so. So I think there's a lot we can do in the area of, of interfaith relations, but I think we also just need to be confident um, that the liberal, democratic and open values for which we stand are the best solutions to the challenges that we, that we face. And while of course we will continue to um, explore and uh, uh, develop security partnerships across the region. It is in that area of people to people and cultural links uh, where I think most of the answers will lie. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, maybe we can move to other uh, issues. Uh, it's economic issues. There are uh, several uh, questions uh, for you. Cassandra uh, from PGSD. Uh, Question, as the president of uh, G7 this year, the UK established an economic resilience panel working with OECD to formulate a recommendation. Moving on, how does Excellency see the G7 implement recommendation uh, from this panel, particularly in assisting the global South countries? Uh, the second is uh, Monica, also from PGSD. Um, it's important uh, that both parties discuss persistent uh, barriers to trade and investment link. And what is the strategy uh, for the two countries to reduce existing barriers? And also, uh, Irene uh, Sitomorang, also from PGSD, uh, he series questions specifically, which issues would UK be focused on in the scope of ASEAN following the opening UK mission to ASEAN? What are the considerations taken to focus on this issue? Please, uh, Excellency. Thank you. I will do my best. Um, those, those questions um, could be the subject of a whole other lecture, um, but I, I will try not to be so, so lengthy. Um, so, uh, yes, the economic resilience and building back better were key themes of um, the, the G7 presidency, which the UK has held this year. And um, quite a lot on, on those topics came out of the Carbis Bay summit um, back in, in July. Um, and we're very conscious, although the G7 is a partnership of uh, developed economies, um, that uh, economic recovery needs to be a global issue. Um, it's something where the developed economies and developing economies need to, need to work together. And that's why the panel that was established um, it was such an important element. I think we're still in the process of uh, implementing the, the recommendations um, which we, uh, which 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 are coming out, the the work that's going on on that, um, I think as the uh, as the COVID pandemic continues, we're not we're not out of it yet. Um, the the way in which we work on recovery uh, will continue to evolve, but one thing which I think will continue to be consistent 
is that we need to ensure that that COVID recovery work um, goes hand in hand with the sustainable and green recovery, which we need, we know, which we know that we need. So I think in working with our developing country partners, um, the G7 and the UK in particular, will be very conscious of our commitment to support developing countries um, through climate finance, but also through our, uh, our normal development assistance, whether that be humanitarian or focused on sustainable development, um, to take forward that, that recovery. And I think we, we are also conscious that um, of the inter interdependence in this. So it is not wholly self, it's not, it's, it's partly self-interested um, that we know the world needs to recover together and the world needs all to recover in a sustainable way. So we're keen to support that. I think the G7 OECD work is an important part of informing that work. And we do intend to, to take forward its conclusions. Um, uh, in terms of um, ASEAN, um, now that we're a dialogue partner, we, we are committed to working across the pillars of ASEAN and across all of the geographies. So the next step for us uh, will be to uh, agree a programme of action um, with ASEAN. There will be a, a negotiation process to agree how we will work um, across um, the economy, people to people issues, cultural issues, security issues and so on. Um, all of the key themes which ASEAN pays, pays so much attention to. Um, so. Um, Excuse me. Some of the issues that I've that I've mentioned, um, such as such as climate, climate, economic um, recovery, um, shared prosperity, um, will be important parts of that program. I'm sure, but until it's developed, uh, we won't have the full set of priorities. Um, I think I've missed part of one of the questions. Um, uh, Can you remind me? That's... Um... G7 or the response, uh, the barriers, uh, the barriers. Both barriers uh, yes. How, how, how? What is the strategy to to reduce existing barriers? So, so this is an area where the UK has been able to take advantage of the new um, flexibility that we have now that we're no longer a member of the European Union. Um, so previously, of course, trade was a, a competence um, for the European Commission, um, and now we're able to have a bilateral relationship. Uh, with Indonesia and other trading partners. So what we've done is established a, uh, a JETCO, a Joint Economic and Trade Committee, uh, which is led at, at cabinet, cabinet minister level. Um, and then there will be sectoral working groups underneath to really look in detail at some of the barriers um, in specific areas um, that might be on renewable energy, it might be on food and drink, it might be on agriculture. Um, it, it will identify issues where by lowering barriers, both sides uh, will ben benefit. And that was underpinned by quite a comprehensive joint trade review, which we did in the first half of this year together with Indonesia, which provided the evidence base, which the JETCO and its working groups will, will go on. So um, that's, that's probably a bureaucrat's answer, um, but I think it shows that we do have um, quite a formal and quite a structured process to identify and deal with the trade barriers in a way that we wouldn't have been able to um, uh, when we were a member of the EU. Thank you. Do we still have uh, time, uh, Ambassador? Maybe five minutes for the last uh, round? Yes, that's fine. I think uh, I would read the, the, the topic on the COVID-19. Uh, uh, Martin Haposan uh, from PGSD, could you describe exchange or official communication between diplomats in the height, uh, the height of uh, pandemic, particularly regarding the travel restriction, uh, were decision made uh, unitarily uh, informed or uh, understood by counterpart. Also, Bimarendra, are the Chinese vaccine accepted by UK uh, when Indonesia residents applying for a UK visa? Uh, Irvan Maulana, how the UK government uh, handles uh, the COVID-19 pandemics and cooperate with other countries. And the last one uh, from Deodora, uh, from also from PGSD, according to, to uh, COVID-19 pandemic, how is your opinion to provide analysis and policy recommendation for the government uh, on the depth of uh, socio-economic impact of the pandemic on various host household uh, group, uh, how to expand the social protection. Please, Excellency. 
Thank you. I'm, I may struggle on that last one. I'm a, I'm a diplomat <laughs> rather than a social scientist. Um, I, 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 again, will do my best. The first question is an excellent one, that the question of how diplomacy worked, how diplomats interacted during COVID-19. Um, I mean, I've been a diplomat for 30 years, and if you told me um, two years ago that uh, I would have to do diplomacy without meeting anybody, I would tell you uh, I'm done, it's impossible. Um, but actually, I think today's event shows that we can have really constructive and productive exchanges um, through virtual means. Um, and I've been really impressed by the flexibility and agility of um, diplomatic partners in Indonesia and around the world to, to moving to a largely online um, uh, version of it. Um, and sometimes it enables us to reach audiences um, that we can't reach um, simply uh, sitting in a room. I think that some of the um, some of the online lectures that I've given, such as this one, reach much more dispersed audiences and therefore much larger audiences than I could do by coming to a lecture hall and and simply giving a lecture to those who could be there at the at that point. Um, and similarly, I think um, it's been easier to bring in experts from the UK. So um, seminars which previously would have required two um, you know eighteen hour flights and staying in hotels and so on. We can just bring in an expert um, from the UK into a seminar um, to talk to Indonesian counterparts uh, much more quickly and easily, and much cheaper. Um, so actually, we've achieved a lot. Um, there are things we can't do, and I think the the, the sort of uh, the personal chemistry won't be replaced by this, and that's why we are holding COP26 in person, for example, because we know that when it gets down to detailed, tough negotiations. You need to be able to sit down with somebody and have a cup of coffee and understand um, what they need and how to work best together. So that will continue. But I think we've learned a lot um, to do that. Um, on the questions about uh, about vaccines, um, so at the moment the the UK um, is supporting the rollout of, of Chinese vaccines through through COVID. Uh, we recognise the the WHO uh, uh, emergency use uh, agreement, um, but for in immigration to the UK, we recognise vaccines which have been approved by the UK's medical and health regulatory authority, uh, which currently do, don't include the Chinese, uh, the Chinese vaccines. Um, though new evidence, new work is being done all, all the time on, on that. Um, so that's where we are at the moment. Uh, in terms of the impact on, on groups, I think that um, I think every country in the world has, has taken a different approach um, to this and developed different schemes to recognise the the very different needs of of their societies. Um, I'm not a I'm not a social scientist, so I uh, I can't give a good analysis of uh, how those different schemes have have impacted on people. But I think the the challenge which we've all faced as governments is how do we really clamp down on the vaccine on on the on the on the virus um, while still ensuring that people can earn a living. Um, and that our economies don't don't collapse, and that's been a difficult balance to strike, and it's been different in every in every country, and therefore um, the, the the means of social support and the programs have looked different in different places. Um, but I think that's all I can probably say on that. Um, I think I've answered those those questions. But tell me if I've missed something. Okay, thank you, uh, thank you, Excellencies. Uh, I know uh, there are many uh, following question. Also, some uh, question also on the chat room, but I can't uh, read uh, all of uh, uh, the, the 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 rest due to the time limit. I should end the the, the session. Uh, thank you again, uh, His Excellency okay. Ambassador Jenkins, uh, for sharing your knowledge and insight to us uh, this afternoon. Uh, we are very pleased to have you here to discuss the future of uh, UK Indonesia strategic partnership. Please join me uh, to give virtual applause to Ambassador Jenkins. I would not make any conclusion, uh, but I think Ambassador lecture today uh, has been invaluable and helped us uh, to understand the complexity of uh, diplomacy and foreign policy in practice. Uh, finally, I would like to express my highest appreciation to Ambassador Jenkins, also to all attendees. Uh, may I thank you for your participation in this session. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the discussion and I look forward uh, to your participation in the future um, Meet the Ambassador Service Forum. Uh, to close this event, uh, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Phil Siska Praboningkas, 
Director of Paramadina Graduate School of Diplomacy to give a closing remark. Please, uh, Dr. Siska, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Anton Ali Abbas. Once again, His Excellency Ambassador uh, Owen Jenkins, it's uh, very an honor. It is a very grateful on behalf of uh, Paramadina Graduate School, the Graduate School of Diplomacy, to uh, have the opportunity to listen for such uh, inspiring lectures uh, re uh, in regard to the complexity of today uh, challenges uh, world including also the potential of uh, further cooperation. Uh, I'll, I'll also uh, uh, thank for uh, our rector, Professor Didi uh, Rahbini, our vice uh, rectors, Ibu Fatia, our dean, Ibu Tia, and uh, my colleague uh, at the Department of International Relations and Pak Tato, fellow uh, lecturers and fellow students. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your uh, support on the event. I think uh, all the questions that have been raised actually reflect uh, the, the fruitful, the variety of our students. Uh, since it was uh, 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 not a format in 2011, Paramadinet Graduate School did offer an international class of uh, international relations. Uh, focus on diplomacy and our student is a very variety professional from active diplomats uh, and also uh, professional from the governments and private sectors, non-government organizations, journalists, and also as a uh, military. Uh, uh, new batch of uh, students also uh, work for the ASEAN uh, Secretariat. There's no wonder there's some questions about the ASEAN on the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, fellow students. Uh, uh, this international uh, uh, class also, we are proud that our alumni also, uh, uh, one of them uh, come from Cambodia, uh, currently uh, become the um, uh, Cambodian ambassador to ASEAN. So this is a very, uh, a very uh, great opportunity for us to rightly listen to the to uh, the lectures. So this event actually uh, show and reflect our confidence, and I fully uh, support and agree. I think it shared the same value that we uh, really uphold the, the idea and the value of collective action and collaboration. Uh, this is uh, uh, also one of the main missions of Paramadinet Graduate School of uh, Diplomacy to provide, like I mentioned, about education that tends to bridging uh, the gap between the, the theoretical uh, challenges and the practical way. So this uh, program was intended to create uh, engagement uh, between stakeholders uh, because of the variety of our student, as well as also uh, wants to uh, provide a creating a room for further uh, discussion, for, uh, constructive discussions uh, in regard to the uh, narrowing the gap, bridging the gap on how uh, public policy and uh, uh, policy policymakers and the public can engage in such in, a uh, complex world and more engaging uh, a world. At that point, also, I would like to uh, share our uh, next upcoming event uh, in regard to our commitment to ensure the quality of our education, including another session with our ambassador to uh, United Kingdom, actually, uh, His Excellency Destra uh, uh, Percaya is going also to give a lecture to give a, a balanced uh, balance view on the bilateral relation between UK and Indonesia. Also, we already prepare a, a forum of a global security review uh, who will uh, going to have a lecture uh, from professor from King College of London as well as uh, University of Bath. Uh, other than that, he also uh, wants to continue our good partnership with uh, University of the member country of uh, Iora, 
that also deal with the issue of Indo-Pacific. Once again, it is a very grateful and an honor for Paramat Graduate School of Diplomacy to have your uh, lecture today. Thank you very much, His Excellency. Thank you very much. Thank you again. I wish everyone here always happy, healthy, and good luck in the fight uh, against uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullah and sampai jumpa lagi. Thank you, Ambassador Owen. Thank you, Thank Ambassador. You very much.